welcome to the curiosity of a child episode 19 yeah <laughs> so how are you doing mate uh, i'm good happy to be on holiday but going back to school soon yeah it's your last week isn't it yeah so you are kind of on holiday this episode <laughs> it's mainly uh, a daddy episode this time yeah yeah but you've been asking me to do another guernsey plate um, a long time yes and i've finally done one um, and you went on a fishing trip, didn't you? Yeah, I've been fishing. I went on the fastest fishing boat in Guernsey. Cool. Um, and I caught six fish. Mm-hmm. Uh, I think I caught a massive bream, sort of, because I got my um, fishing line tangled in my friend's fishing line. So we kind of joint That's caught it. Collaborative. That's good. So yeah. I like that. It's working together. Um, I caught a few mackerel and a couple of blue mackerel, too. And we brought some home uh, oh yeah, yeah and my other other friend he named some of his fish <laughs> okay <laughs> he named uh, that reminds me actually when um i can't remember who organized it but there's a campaign to rename fish sea kittens to make them appear cuter so people would uh, maybe give them more love and respect than they get yeah We've also been up to a few other things, so if you follow us on Twitter, you might have seen a photo of Anton holding a World War II pistol yeah. with a rather large grin on his face. <laughs> um, and it was taken at the Vintage Agricultural Show. Yeah, so I held a World War II pistol, so that's what the officers would use. I mm -hmm. think it was a Webble, mini Webble or something. Mm -hmm. um, I held a rifle, <laughs> quite a big rifle. It's quite heavy, wasn't it? Yeah. And a kind of submachine gun sort of thing, wasn't it? Um, yeah. It had the gun on the, uh, the mag on the side or magazine on the side. Yeah, and you're told that it was really uncomfortable, though. You said. Was it? Yeah, it's awkward to uh, to hold. hold. Yeah. yeah. Um, but I'm not sure what sort of farming people used to do um, to require such powerful weaponry. <laughs> yeah. So, did you enjoy the show generally? It's, yeah, I loved it because there were lots of different stools, and I got some yummy. Uh, Guernsey Golden Goat Milk Fudge. Mm -hmm. And there are lots of World War II vehicles there as well. Uh, lots of Woolies Jeeps and stuff and uh, a few motorbikes. I'm not sure if that was a sidecar. Uh, so, Anton, what colourful curved thing that you see in the sky has been used to represent Guernsey together? Rainbows. Yeah. <laughs> and then I had this quote the other day about rainbows and they've not always been such a positive sign. Yeah. So there is a Byzantine monk and chronicler called Theophanes the Confessor. Now, do you know who the Byzantians were? Um, an empire. Yeah, where did they come from? Byzantium. They were the Romans, weren't they, really? Yeah. The continuation of the Roman Empire. Yeah. Anyway, here's his quote. So, in this year of March, a rainbow appeared in the sky and all mankind shuddered. Everyone said it was the end of the world. <laughs> It's a little bit different to how we perceive them today, isn't it? Yeah. And there's a picture of him with his halo. <laughs> it's like a giant ring around his head. Well, a halo. <laughs> we also had a really great review of the podcast on Podchaser by Ned Donovan. So thank you very much. And you're going to read it out, Anton? Mm-hmm. What a podcast! Sometimes ideas hit the perfect connection between intent and execution. And this is one of those shows. A must listen. Thank you very much. Now, I looked Ned I up. I think my accents are better than yours. Yeah, maybe you'll be doing all of the um, quotes from now on. <laughs> yeah, so I looked Ned up, and he's an actor and producer. Um, so we have a link to his show reel in the show notes. <laughs> so thank you, Ned. And why don't you follow in his footsteps and review us on Apple Podcasts or Podchaser? And now, with all the pressure on us, should we get on with the show? <laughs> on with the show. Now, the cold, desolate conditions of the Siberian tundra are perfect for preserving bodies. The ground can be permanently frozen, the population is sparse, and there are few scavengers able to survive in such harsh conditions. So, uh, do you know where Siberia is? Um, somewhere cold. Not really. It's kind of the northern part of Russia, particularly going over to the east. Mm -hmm. So, I've actually got a map for yeah, you yeah. here. Yeah, you can see China. So, St. Petersburg is here. Yeah. Because a lot of it is permanently snowy and frozen and icy there. Yeah. Now, back in 2013, a 40,000-year-old mammoth um, <laughs> was uncovered there, and it was nicknamed Buttercup. Buttercup for <laughs> yeah. mammoth. And it's found in the permafrost. Now, what was remarkable um, about this mammoth was the body actually still contained liquid blood. It was actually 
like liquid. It wasn't frozen. No, no it was frozen at the time, but oh, when they so recovered it, had, okay. um, it thawed out. So you could kind of cut into the flesh and it would bleed. Ah, oh, yeah, that's cool. And there was enough kind of DNA kind of preserved in that blood that they'd actually be able to claim the creature if they wanted to. That is very cool. <laughs> yeah, amazing, isn't it? Yeah. It was a truly remarkable find. And to quote Dr. Herridge, Hello. As a paleontologist, you normally have to imagine the extinct animals you work on. So actually coming face to face with a mammoth in the flesh and being up to my elbows in slippery, wet and frankly rather smelly mammoth liver counts as one of the most remarkable, uh, incredible experiences of my life. Lovely. Yeah. <laughs> so uh, that must be an amazing find though for somebody who their life is kind of investigating these animals yeah, and to and find the, and that. Yeah, and you get like a, well, pretty much a lo living. <laughs> yeah, like it had just been recently yeah. killed. Yeah. Yeah. Now, how would you describe a woolly mammoth to someone? Um, an elephant with brown fur, I think, or some mm -hmm. sort of fur. And a furry elephant, then. Yeah, <laughs> with almost like a hat. <laughs> now, if you had a rhinoceros that was hairy like a mammoth, what would you call it? A hairy rhinoceros. So, do you want to see what one would look like? Okay. Actually, okay. This is actually just a little square of um, frozen flesh from a woolly rhinoceros. And this was actually found in the stomach of a frozen dog, um, which was also found in the tundra. So it's amazing how scientists can tell from such a small scrap of flesh found inside an animal that was frozen thousands of years ago what it was. Yeah. And let's have a proper photo now of what a furry <laughs> um, it woolly rhinoceros. It looks like a giant sloth. Yeah, it kind of does, doesn't it? Yeah. Or something like Jim Henson would do, or the Muppets. Yeah. Or that looks like it's a horse with some lots and lots of hair stuck in it. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> or a giant horsey thing. <laughs> yeah, so the photo here, which we're put onto the show notes, is actually of a baby woolly rhinoceros and discovered in Siberia. And there's a skeleton, amazing horn on them. Whoa. I love megafauna. You wouldn't, it looks stuck on. Yeah. It does. <laughs> Now, the animal in which the woolly rhino was found was the first fully mummified dog ever discovered. <laughs> Nicknamed Tumat, after the village near where it was unearthed by two brothers in 2011. Now, they think the dog was about 12,500 years old and it's really, really well preserved. Wow. So, you can see here on a map that I've got you that Tumat is really up in the north of Russia, isn't it? Yeah, that's very, very high. And quite far to the east. Tumat is in the Saka Republic, and in 2010, its population was only 533 people. Wow! So it's remote and tiny. <laughs> yeah. Must be an odd place to live. Now, Dr. Darima Gomeva... His <laughs> <Next> name? <laughs> yeah, I think I got that right. Um, professor of the NEFU Medical Institute said... What is the real interest is, in fact, the animal has a completely reserved carcass which is unique by itself, with nothing like it in the world. Although the tissues are mummified, they have no post-mortem decomposition, um, as it usually happens with biological material. Yeah, so the permafrost... Thrust? <laughs> the permafrost preserved it really well. <laughs> Now, the dog herself, she was actually just a little puppy, probably about three months old. Um, and it's hoped that by studying her body, we'd be able to get a better understanding of the development of modern day dogs yeah. and kind of where they came from. So I've got a photo for you here, which is the, uh, a photo of the puppy undergoing its autopsy. <laughs> That's well preserved. <laughs> it looks like crisps with the autopsy, but... I was thinking leaf litter or something. Yeah. <laughs> Giant poppadons or something. <laughs> now, dogs were domesticated probably somewhere between 18,000 and 32,000 years ago, uh, maybe in Europe or Siberia. Yeah. But I couldn't find any evidence that Tumat was somebody's pet or not. Mm hmm I've got another quote here from a Dr. Jamon Prey, and she says, There are two main theories. The first is that dogs arrived near sites where humans lived and picked up scraps, and gradually they coexisted. The second version talks about active involvement of man, where the people themselves were the initiator of the relationship and brought the puppies to their home and trained them. Yeah, you want to get them when they're small, otherwise they're going to get angry. <laughs> yeah, 
It's funny, there's actually a dog barking outside as we speak yeah, about them. Yeah. Woof, woof. And now I've got a photo of another uh, poppy here, which was found in this similar area um, mm -hmm. a couple of years later. And you can understand why maybe humans would want to domesticate dogs. Oh, yeah. Yeah, yeah. Big teeth. Yeah, exactly. They'd be great for protecting you from predators funny, and hunting. Funny enough, it's just like the mouth band. It looks pretty odd, too. So it looks a bit like platypus um, lips and stuff <laughs> with te giant teeth. <laughs> yeah, so Tomat isn't the only doggy to be found in the permafrost. Not far from where she was found, there was a second dog discovered a couple of years later. And you might wonder why it took so long for them to discover the next one and you'll see it's quite hard to see them. Yeah, it's pretty camouflaged. You can sort of see an outline, kind of. So this is a photo yeah. here of basically a big pile of thick, loopy mud, it looks like. Yeah, and, and uh, snow on top of it. And the dog's just coated. Yeah. I can see a sort of face there, can you? Mm -hmm. uh, not a dog's face, a human face. Oh, yeah? Yeah. Oh. I'm good at spotting faces. I mean, humans are. Yeah, it's called paragoilia, that you see faces and yeah. things. And I did find a more recent story of another doggy discovery, which was another poppy found in 2017. This one probably 18,000 years old. And they're not actually sure if this was a dog or a wolf, but it looks kind of cute. <laughs> so uh, you can imagine that being somebody's pet. <gasps> that looks like a teddy. It does, doesn't it? That does. I think it's probably been done up for the photo shoot. Yeah. As you can see, like really well preserved, fluffy fur, the whiskers, honey, and the eyes, yeah. uh, the eyelashes. Yeah. And I think the first doggy, too, Matt, that I showed you, yeah. um, from other photos, most of the body was uh, probably destroyed during the autopsy. scientific investigation yeah. Yeah, and the autopsy. Um, but you can see this one becoming like the poster boy of ancient canines. <laughs> yeah. I mean, you can sort of see its um, ribs a bit bones but um on one side but it still looks really it looks cool. a bit like a fluffy piglet to me mm -hmm. their face actually yeah that's true the face has definitely changed <laughs> in dogs now people they actually use water cannons to break through the permafrost uh, because they're searching for different treasures hidden there like uh, mammoth tusks then you could imagine kind of as the like the climate warms up that there's gonna be more and more frozen animals starting to be uncovered mm -hmm. under the ice and the frost um, so we're going to have to be really fast to find them before they rot away. Or maybe get eaten by modern dogs. <laughs> yeah. And that reminds me of a story I heard uh, recently of, um, you know, they've got body farms in America where they put maybe a corpse or possibly a pig or something yeah. out in different conditions. Yeah. And then they might wrap them up and just see how they decompose. So um, yeah. forensics people can understand the decomposition of bodies. Uh -huh. uh, there was a story of a cat visiting one of these body farms and having a little nibble on the bodies. <laughs> so could you imagine uh, little mittens coming home? <laughs> yeah. sprightly, bright-eyed, licking its lips. <laughs> and, and he drags a dead body through the door. A hand or something. Yeah. Look he's he's trying to drag it through the um, cat flap. Yeah. <laughs> so we're going to move on to some other doggies now. <laughs> these rush has a very long history with canines. And I want to take a moment to remember two amazing ones from 1960. Now, the two in question are Belka and Strelka. So, Whitey and Little Arrow. Yes. I hope I got their names right. And they're both female dogs and about 2.5 years old. Or two and a half years old. <laughs> and here's a picture of them, but I think it looks like a taxidermy. It does. <laughs> their eyes have been... Uh, like... Uh, why? But I... their eyes are glinting and both of their mouths are open and they look too still to actually... Well, they're cute. And that one looks like it's just a head of a dog. Yeah, which we're going to do a feature on something like that one day. <clears throat> um, <laughs> now, do you know anything about these dogs and why they were selected? They were sent into space. That's right, yeah. Both dogs did really well in their doggy training. <laughs> and um, they were selected as canine cosmonauts for the Sputnik 5 mission. And this would be a one-day flight in space. Oh, just having a quick trip to space, you know. Yeah. Yeah, and quite it, usual. So a couple of weeks ago, on August the 19th to the 20th, that was the 60th anniversary of their flight into and safe return from space. And they were actually the first animals to safely come home from orbit. So the first living things, then? Yeah, which came back. Yeah, <laughs> which came back. Yeah. Yeah, but let's not also forget the mice, insects, plants, seeds, fungi and microbe cultures that went with them. <laughs> yeah. 
and they were they had a 25 hour flight and they went around the earth 17 times and traveled 700,000 kilometers wow dogs can run a very long way mhm mm and i think one of the dogs which they had a, a video feed mm -hmm. and they could see that it, uh, she got distressed a little bit um during some of the flights so they actually reduced um the length of Yuri Gagarin's flight into space based on uh, yeah, information they found. Yeah, she was the first man in space. Yes. Yeah. Officially the first one. Mm -hmm. So there's some interesting stories around that. Anyway, um, so who knows, those frozen dogs we were speaking about before... Could that... have been there if they fell out the M rocket, whatever it was. <laughs> well, ancient, ancient space cosmonaut dogs. Yeah. So who knows, those frozen dogs found in the permafrost, they might be the ancient ancestors of Belka and Strelka, and the people who helped domesticate them are a forgotten part of the space race. Yeah. <laughs> You've been asking for a while for another Guernsey break, haven't you? Yeah. And I've kind of been putting it off because I was trying to find the right person. I've got one for you here, and it's not as long as the two-parter we did on Sir Isaac Brock. And they're rather less well-known, but I did find one website which rated her as Women who kick ass number 83. <laughs> okay? <laughs> yeah, okay. Introducing Margaret Ann Neve, born in Guernsey in 1792. Do you know what she's else? She's still alive today, is she? No. So, do you know what else happened in 1792? 1792 is also the year the first regularly flushing toilet was invented. So yeah. That, so, that probably helped. Mm hmm. Margaret was the first ever recorded. Super centenarian. Now, do you know what that means? Um, somebody who lives like a century or older. 110 years. Whoa. Um, so there's one man recorded before this, and he was a Dutch chap called Gert Andres Boomgaard, <laughs> which I've definitely pronounced wrong. Um, he seems to have every single name he's got a double, a double letter. It's like G E E, um, A A, and A A again. Although there are some Chinese records which supposedly tell stories of um, a man aged over 250 years. I um, told that to the teacher and she didn't listen. <laughs> now Margaret, she was also the first person proven to live in three different centuries. <laughs> so she was born 18th of May 1792 and passed away aged 110 years and 321 days on the 4th of April 1903. Whoa! And I got a photo of her here when she was 110 I think. I love that photo. Yeah, I think it's a good got, photo. I think she'd be a good character. She looks good fun. Mm -hmm. <laughs> she looks like I am not amused. <laughs> so can you imagine how much kind of things must have changed during her lifetime? Yeah, it's like, and especially in the Victorian period, when mm -hmm. so many new things were invented. Yeah, it's a time of a lot of change, wasn't it? Yeah. Um, so I'm going to show you some photos of the English monarchs who reigned during her lifetime, OK? <laughs> yeah. So we start with George III, and he reigned from 1760 to 1820. So 1760 sounds so long ago! <laughs> yeah. And uh, so here's a painting of him. Now, does this look like a really old picture to you? No. That, that actually looks like a photograph with a good camera. OK, yeah, it's an amazing painting, but I mean the style of the dress and everything. Yeah, yeah, that... He's, it looks pretty heavy what he's wearing. He's wearing a lot. He's got like gold mm -hmm. and like roy the royal um, sort of capes where you've got white and then black dots. That's really yeah. But uh, you could that looks like a, a very old painting, so yeah, doesn't it? Amazing uh, painting though. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Even the light on the step that he's standing on reflecting. So next up is George the Fourth. Now the monarchy was going through a bit of a naming crisis at the time, I think. Yeah. There's just many, many Georges, and he ruled from 1820 to 1830. Clues have changed. It's got redder. Mm -hmm. but it's still got that white and black dots sort yeah. of theme. But again, it still looks like a long yeah. time ago, doesn't it? So and she was alive during yeah. this time. So the next up is William the Fourth, and he was from 1830 to 1837. Oh, that's um, changed. The colours have changed again. He's got a sword this time. You might recognise the next monarch. Queen Victoria. Yes, Queen Victoria. Now, she had a very long reign, didn't she? Yeah. From 1837 to 1901. And it's actually a photo. And it's starting to feel a little bit more contemporary mm -hmm. now. And I think you're fine with Edward the Seventh. Now, he was king from 1901 to 1910. Mm -hmm. um, 
that is starting to look very modern. And Margaret just missed out on um, George number five by a few weeks. Oh. But if you look at the difference there, so how's he dressed? He's wearing like kind of work clothes. You'd have, um, he's got a suit with, some, with a tie mm -hmm. and um, everything. Yeah, so a big transformation, isn't it, during yeah. her lifetime. And we'll put all then... of these pictures in the show notes. Before we go into her life, we're going to cover a few of the changes that happened during her lifetime, okay? Mm -hmm. So the world population roughly doubled from about 980 million to 1.7 billion people yeah. while she was alive. Then the amazing photo that I showed you earlier of uh, Margaret, she was aged 110 then. Uh, but she couldn't have had any photos of her childhood because cameras weren't invented until she was 34. <laughs> yeah. Then in 1783, just nine years before she was born, um, there was the first ever untethered hot air balloon flight. <laughs> um, then when she was aged 111 years, the Wright brothers took to the air at King Devil Hills and recorded the first ever heavier than air flight. So she encompassed the entire early period of... Flight. Yeah. Yeah. I also like that one of the witnesses of the uh, Wright Brothers flight was a boy from the village. Yeah. <laughs> I imagine him running up there yeah, since he came to school to or something. That's what I was about to say. He's like, I've had a bad day at school, I'm leaving. Oh, <gasps> plane! Yeah. Whoa, fly! <laughs> Maybe he named them. <laughs> yeah. He, he had a plane day. Mm -hmm. Now, staying with America for a moment, she was born not long after the American Revolution, and another famous George, this one Washington, uh, became the first president of the US. And uh, they were still a small power at the time, but by her death, they were really becoming a major player on the world. They were expanded lots too, so here you go, in 1783, this is the original 13 colonies, and then you can see in 1803 the Louisiana Purchase, which brought from France, then Texas in, in 1845, and Mexico, so you can see how much America yeah. became a, a major country during her lifetime. Yeah. So she would have been probably it's hearing all of this. It's got its proper shape now. Mm-hmm. We'll put this map as well in the, on the website. But let's get back to Margaret. But now I've put her life in a little bit more context of what was going on in the world. Now, there isn't that much uh, information about her, but what we do have is really fascinating. So it seems like she came from a pretty well-off family, and her father, John Harvey, uh, was involved in merchant shipping and privateering. <laughs> yeah. And his men have earned a great deal of wealth through doing this. Um, but he died aged 49. But her mum, Elizabeth, seems to have given her the longevity genes, and she lived to 99. Wow. Margaret was actually born Marguerite Anne Harvey, but she later anglicised her name. Now, I reckon this is probably due to wars with France. Yeah, because that sounds French. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Too French. Yeah. Now, as a young child, she fell down some stairs and she uh, suffered kind of a serious concussion and she was actually um, out for three days. So it must have been quite a serious fall. Yeah, stone stairs. Mm hmm And during her early life, um, the French Revolution was in full swing. So France changed a lot during her lifetime, as did, uh, say, England's and consequently Guernsey's relationship with France. Yeah. Um, so, you know, there's, we've got loads of towers around the coast. Uh-huh. Um, so those were built, those fortifications were built to protect the island from the French. Yeah, like Castle Corner. Mm -hmm. Exactly. Uh, so it must have been really odd living on a small island off the coast of France um, whilst we were at war with Napoleon. <laughs> yeah, you were at war with like one of the greatest wartime leaders like ever. Yeah, exactly. And this, you've got three castles or forts. That's us still standing today and <laughs> mm -hmm. <laughs> he could survive. Then her father, he was actually in command of the local militia and um, she remembered the turmoil that the revolution brought to Guernsey. Yeah. Uh, but in 1887, she left the island with her dad and they set sail for Weymouth, but a storm blew them off course and they ended up landing on Chesil Beach. And it's not that far off course, as you'll see on this map, but it must have been pretty terrifying because she was 15 at the time. Probably couldn't swim that well, I imagine. So here's Weymouth here. And this funny stretch of land here is Chesil Beach. Mm -hmm. And here's a photo of it. <laughs> what? What? Yeah, it's what's that called a barrier man -made. beach. Is that man-made? I don't think so. So a barrier beach is a small strip of land kind of running parallel with the coastline um, with sea each side of it. And how many pebbles do you think make that up that? It's just... Like just this little bit? Or... The whole thing. The whole thing. Mm. 56 billion. How about 180 billion pebbles? Ah, <laughs> oh, so close. 
<laughs> well, it must be in a scary place to land in a storm. So there wouldn't have been any electric lights or anything back then? Or Yeah. Probably none. Now, the reason she moved to England was to study in Bristol, and she gained a real interest in poetry and literature at that time. And I'd like to actually know how much the English language changed during her lifetime. <laughs> yeah. So there must have been a lot of um, changes. <laughs> Then after that, she moved to a finishing school in Brussels. And it seems she became a bit of a polyglot. Um, as she became fluent in French and Italian, and could also talk in German and Spanish. <laughs> but that's not all. Well, she was amazing, really, because she could also read the Bible in Greek. <laughs> yeah. You would have heard of the Battle of Waterloo? Yeah. Yeah, so she visited the battlefield a few years after the event with her headmistress, um, once all the corpses had been buried. <laughs> mm -hmm. Um, and she also returned there on her honeymoon in 1823 with her husband, John. And her diaries from her honeymoon can be found at the Brewery Library. That's cool. We'll have to see if we can see those. Now, during one of these visits, she found a belt buckle from an Imperial Guard soldier, which she later showed Star to... Star Wars. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> she later showed to Gebhard Leberek von Blocher, which I've totally butchered. Which is really bad. She's probably he is very famous as he was the Prussian field marshal during the Battle of Waterloo. <laughs> so um, to be kind of meeting like a man like him, she must have been um, in pretty high circles at that time. Yeah, very important. And there's a photo of him there. He looks cool. Mm -hmm. See the German cross there. Got quite, yeah, he's got quite a good moustache. <laughs> she also met a general of the French Revolutionary Wars, Charles Francois Dumouriez who nicknamed her La Spiritale. So I'm not quite sure how that was meant, but it suggests that they knew each other reasonably well. So again, she's kind of mixing with these with high society, mm -hmm. it seems. Now, sadly, uh, her husband died in 1849, and she never remarried or had any children. Mm. Then her life after her husband's death was as long as many people would live their full life <laughs> as well, because she lived for so long. Yeah. She returned to Guernsey, where she lived with her sister, Elizabeth. Um, but her adventures were not over yet. <laughs> she and her sister, they enjoyed travelling. And their last trip was in 1872, where aged 80, she visited Krakow in Poland. <laughs> <laughs> That's cool. So there's another photo of her here. Yeah. She's got a bit of a cheeky smile. Yeah. Oh, you can see there. And another little photo. Mm-hmm. Now, it seems that age was no obstacle to her. And in 1899... Uh, there's a gathering of over 250 kind of local Guernsey residents, kind of leading ones on the island, uh, to celebrate her 107th birthday. And she's even interviewed by the Times newspaper. And she told the reporter that she's fond of making marmalade. <laughs> <laughs> and the year she was born, actually, was the year that oranges were introduced into Hawaii. But cool. I don't think she got hers from there. <laughs> um, and she says she never got ill until she was 105 years old when she got the flu. Wow, and she survived the flu as well. That always was pretty good. And uh, Margaret also liked apples, particularly freshly picked ones, which <laughs> she said were tastier if they were straight from the tree. So aged 110, she climbed up an apple tree to pick one. Really? Yeah. And she... <laughs> In her massive dress. Mm-hmm. And now I like to think of... Um, being like a young child and they kind of sneak into the neighbour's orchard and steal yeah. a tree. Uh, steal a tree? Steal <laughs> a tree. She's not that strong, is right. she? Steal an apple from a tree. <laughs> yeah, she probably did that like... Climb, climb, climb. Did she steal the teeth then? Is that <laughs> yeah, yeah. I guess people didn't eat so many sweets and things back then. Their teeth yeah. kind of survived. <laughs> now, a bit of a mythology started to grow around her. And there are a few reports in American newspapers of her becoming friends with the Queen Victoria. <laughs> That's not quite true. And there's actually uh, some telegrams um, between her family and Queen Victoria, kind of almost apologising for this confusion. The stories in the American newspapers went that um, Queen Victoria would send her birthday telegram every year and uh, had a photo of Miss Neve in the Royal Summer House but they're not true. Um, but she did receive a signed photo of the Queen. That's nice. Mm hmm And what do you think the key to her long life was? Mm, climbing up apple trees and eating the apples. Staying fit. Maybe. Staying fit, yeah, staying <laughs> younger at heart, food, I reckon. So, yeah. Now, the answer might be found in an article titled The Oldest Woman in the World from the Clarence and Raymond Examiner, dated Tuesday the 19th, February 1901. She is not an abstainer, 
but takes a glass and a half of old sherry at her midday dinner and a little weak whiskey and water at supper. In diet, she does not greatly restrict herself, but she has always objected to eating or drinking between regular hours or meals, and even afternoon tea has been rigidly excluded from her household programme. She has always been an early riser, and has never permitted herself any coddling or self-indulgence, but has shown a somewhat Spartan strength of will in refusing them. <laughs> That's good. And from that same article, I really like the description of Guernsey. In that charming little island, renowned for its natural beauties, its soft air, and its remoteness from the storm and stress of modern life. Yeah, that's true. Mm -hmm. Still is today. Yeah. I mean, like, she knew it. There wasn't a storm there. <laughs> Probably wasn't a terrible storm in her life. Well, there was the one where she got shipwrecked. Oh, yeah, I didn't... Uh... <laughs> I'm going to finish with a lovely and funny um, clipping from the Potter Enterprise newspaper. Now, it's an American paper which shows how far her fame had spread. I've lately seen a picture of a comely, spry old lady who danced a minute and sang sweet songs of her youth at the age of 97. There is lying on my desk a picture of King Edward's oldest subject, 111 years of age, this 12th of May. She is Miss Margaret Anne Neve, and she lives in the pretty island of Guernsey. She is sweet-faced, gentle and fair, and looks a handsome old lady of 70. Brave old girls, very aged women, need no longer look like hideous old mummies. <laughs> um, <laughs> do you think that um, Guernsey in wherever it was in America would have existed then or not? I in think Ohio. it would. Yeah, yeah, I think it would, yeah. When she was born or...? Before, after? I don't know Should my states well enough in America, actually, to know. If anybody knows that, you can tell us. So, pretty amazing woman, I think. Must have had an amazing life. Yeah. Could be through a lot. Yeah. And including climbing up an apple tree. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Very intelligent, too, with the different languages she could learn. She's an interesting character who's maybe less well-known than some others. So, what do you think? Cool. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Do you reckon... A good Guernsey great. Yeah. But if you think she was old, how old do you think this shark is, which was recently photographed? Mm, 900 years old. <laughs> Not quite. This is a Greenland shark. Oh, and nearly it's... 400. Maybe. Yeah. Yeah. 393 years old, I think. It's been wandering the ocean since 1627. And it's still alive. Mm-hmm. Whoa. Oh, wow. <laughs> so I hope you enjoyed this show. Please follow us on Twitter at CurieChildPod. Yeah, that was an interesting um, episode today. Slightly different, but I think it was good. Mm -hmm. And we have show notes on the website. Um, and please review us. Yeah, on Apple Podcasts and Podchaser. That's right. Uh, so thank you very much. I'm going to catch you again soon. Bye. Thank you for listening. Bye.